Hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon and a good morning and a good evening to those who have joined us from around the world. My name is Sophia Adonhal, director of the Cooper Gallery, a public art gallery associated with the Cooper Jordanston College of Art and Design at the University of Dundee in Scotland. So I'm delighted to welcome you all to the Ignorant Art School. So I'm also joined by my colleagues Peter Amor, Runa Jack, and uh, Peter Nurek, who will be working behind the scenes to ensure the smooth running of the event. So today's event, Wears Two Hats, is a prelude to the fourth iteration of the Cooper Gallery's ongoing program, the Ignorant Art School, Five Sittings Towards Creative Emancipation, sitting number four, Outside the Circle, which is an exhibition and event program inspired by and generated from feminist and queer movements that foregrounds intersectional feminist and queer strategies of radical emancipation, resistance, survival, and collective action as a critical and pedagogical rupture in our lived experience. So it's even more fitting that this exhibition takes place in Dundee, a city known as a she town for its proud history of strong working class women since the 19th century. So she town was also the spark that initiated Cooper Gallery's two chapter projects, Off Other Spaces, where that gesture become events in 19, six, uh, 20, 2016 and 2017, that investigated the influence of feminism in contemporary art since 1968 and the necessity of self organization, collective endeavor, and alternative politics in culture and society. So today's event is also the fourth and final episode of Practicing Duet, a series of in-conversation events developed by the Ignorant Art Schools Research Group, which is part of the British Arts Network program. British Art Network, also known as BAN, is a subject specialist network supported by Tate and the Paul Mellon Center for Studies in British Art, so I would like to take this opportunity to thank Ben for their generous support. So I am one of the four co-leads of this research group. My collaborators are also here today, Professor Sarah Perks and Dr. Paul Stewart from Teesside University and Dr. Edgar Schmidt from Godsmith in London. So the Ignorant Art Schools Research Group is a distillation of the ongoing exhibition program at the Cooper Gallery that examines the histories and future possibilities of art, education, and creative learning, and the role of creative learning in society, questions, assumptions of what knowledge is and how where it's formed, mediated, and shared, and how knowledge is marked by the violence of power. But more importantly, it emphasizes knowledge as a collective and collaborative endeavor and a social experience against the ongoing economization of knowledge production and education in our society today. So extending the ideas underscoring the Ignorant Art School Exhibition Program, this research group have developed uh, a specific focus on how and where alternative art pedagogy and the new forms of a collective artistic or curatorial agency intersect. So we have been organizing these uh, transdisciplinary in conversation events since last year, bringing together two practitioners who never met each other to share experience, exchange perspectives, and plot new ideas. So today we're thrilled to host two speakers, Griselda Pollock and Varsha Na from Wu Manifesto in Thailand, who are both also participating in the Outside the Circle exhibition. So it's my great pleasure to introduce the speakers. Griselda Pollock is an esteemed feminist, post-colonial and a social art historian, cultural analyst and a curator. She's also Professor Emerita of Social and the Critical Histories of Art at the University of Leeds. So in 1992, Griselda developed a dedicated MA in Feminism and the Visual Arts, 
which will be featured in our forthcoming exhibition outside the circle. A prolific writer and the culture theorist, Griselda's seminal text includes old mistresses, women, art, and ideology with uh, uh, Rosa, Rosa Parker, 1981, Vision and the Difference, 1988, Encounters in the Virtual Feminist Museum, 2007, and After Image, After Effect, Trauma and the Aesthetic Transformation, 2013. So her book, Framing Feminism, Art, and the Women's Movement, 1970 to 1985, co-edited with Rosica Parker, has been a powerful pedagogical space for generations of artists, curators, academics, and the students. Griselda's recent publications include Charlotte Solomon in the Theater of Memory 2018, Killing Men and the Dying Women, Imagining Difference in 1950s New York Painting 2022, and the Woman in Art, Helen Rosenau's Little Book of 1944-2023. So in 2020, Griselda was awarded the Hoberg Prize for her groundbreaking work in feminism and the arts. And in 2023, the CAA Lifetime Achievement Award for writing on art. Representing Woman, Woman Manifesto is Varsha Na, an interdisciplinary artist based in Baroda, India. She lived in Thailand from 1995 to 2019, well as one of the key co-organizers of Wu Manifesto, a feminist artist collective and artist-led international exchange platform. Varsha was instrumental in conceptualizing projects that stretched beyond the traditional model of a Benali exhibition making to produce intergenerational and cross-disciplinary workshops collaborations and the network. As an artist, Varsha has exhibited internationally and her writing has been published in many art journals, including um, the very UK feminist uh, art journal and Paradoxia. So Varsha is currently guest lecturer at the master's program at Lucen University of Applied Sciences and Arts in Switzerland. So now, um, without further ado, I shall give the floor to the speakers. We will start with a presentation from each speaker, followed by an in-conversation between them. There will be an opportunity for audience to respond and ask questions at the end of the event. I also would like to note that alongside friends and the colleagues who are with us online, we're joined by students and the staff as contemporary art practices at the of Jordan Stone College of Art and Design, who are watching the in conversation online in the lecture theater. So, Vasha, maybe you could start. The floor is yours. Thank you. Um, thank you, Sophia. Um, firstly, for inviting me, inviting Woman Festo again um, for sitting number four and um, also to this um, uh, conversation. Uh, it's an honor to uh, share the uh, screen here with you, Griselda. Um, and um, yeah, it's great to thank you all for being, uh, being here, those who are joining in. Um, amongst them is um, a, a group of uh, artists who've been involved with Bo Manifesto as well. So um, yes. It's, it's lovely. It's a lovely gathering, even though I can't see you all. Um, so I'm going to start with 1995, uh, which is when I first uh, arrived in Thailand to live there. And um, Womani Festa was already being set up by a group of Thai women, um, artists, poets, writers, activists, uh, following an exhibition they'd been part of, which was titled Tridi Section, uh, held in the same year. Uh, Rachida Thanapon, Nikliya U Arivorakun, Mink Noparat, and Paptawan Suvarnagut, seen in the photographs from left to right, um, had had a planning meeting uh, for Women Festo at Chulalongkorn University Art Gallery, where Rachida worked. 
Our paths crisscrossed as I too had visited the gallery to see the same exhibition, Miro, the Spirit of the Orient, but on a different day. Soon after, Rachida introduced me to Nitya, and that was the start of our friendship and uh, my journey with Bumali Festo. Um, I relate with the stepping behind the ropes um, and to quote from Nivedita Menon, seeing like a feminist, I see, I see it as a gesture of subversion towards power and that it disorganizes and disorders the settled field, resists hom homogenization and opens up multiple possibilities. And with in initiating Bu Manifesto, the artist organizers took that defiant step in crossing the line to open up and carve out a space in the still predominantly patriarchal landscape. 1995 was also the year that the Fourth World Conference on Women took place in Beijing and the artists were aware of its global agenda of pushing for gender equality. With lack of spaces where they could meet and show, the first Women Festo in 97 was set as an exhibition of works by a group of 18 women, Thai as well as coming from neighboring country, countries and from further away. The start of U Manifesto was also supported by Chumpon and Chantavipa Apisuk in their space, Concrete House, which was the venue uh, for today's section as well. Uh, Concrete House is a site of the head office of Empower Foundation, which they had established as a resource and support center for sex workers, community gatherings, and as an art space focused mainly on performance art. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? Um, Womanifesto has been led by artists to date and it, that it follows an open organizational format whereby any artist who was willing to give time could, uh, could team up to organize and even set up projects in a location of their choice. Um, in the late 90s with minimum support, especially as we worked independently, it was clear that we had to stand on our own and do it by ourselves. The little funding we had barely covered basic costs, which meant we had to dig into our pockets and those joining us in Bangkok often had to pay their own travel, self-organize, help uh, each other to install or bring works together, document and so on. More importantly, they were welcomed in our homes and these became crucial spaces where informal, conversations, our unique perspectives, experiences, and our art practices could be shared. Next, please. So emerging from our conversations was this resounding wish to not stop at the first exhibition. It was planned as just a one-off, but to plan regular gatherings and to do so biannually seemed possible. We also decided that we had to write, talk, disseminate, to draw focus on what we were doing. This was to confront the erasure we felt we were facing in being kept out of the art discourse taking place around us. So in a way it was re refusing to be made invisible. Working outside mainstream art institutions, we were largely left out of artistic narratives of the time. For example, Womanifesto's decentralizing starting with the 2001 work uh, one workshop and uh, launching ongoing conversations within farming and rural communities, we would not even be mentioned or be up for discussion, consideration at local and international, international talks, talks and symposia and in any scholarly research and writings. Next, please. So our exchanges over meals in our homes and not in galleries became important germinating points. Thoughts on how to continue started to be formed at these informal discussions and also through reciprocity with some of us being invited back for events set up by artists who were part of Women Festo, such as Tari Ito in Japan, Amanda Heng in Singapore, and Sanya Ivekovic in Croatia. This was the start of a self-expanding network with a web of connections that were beginning to grow through friendship. And we were not waiting to be curated or asked. Next, 
This also meant that we had to consider keeping to an open-ended format to see what was possible to achieve. The stress was on hospitality and care at its core, and we did not have to plan specific exhibitions as an outcome. Instead, we could host open days or launch events according to the project situation. Editions that followed took diverse forms. Rather than envisioning what the next few projects could be, what emerged from and was experienced at each one became a stepping stone to plan the next one. And the way we have sustained ourselves is by remaining agile, also acknowledging and meeting the other demands on our lives as women and artists. Next, please. After the 1999 two-day event in a public park in Bangkok, featuring as many as 30 participants coming from all over, and the intense and complex organization that entailed, we decided to change course, uh, to leave the city and head to a remote rural area with a smaller group. It was sort of conceived of as like an extended picnic. The idea was to see what could be met by being with a local farming community, including artisans, and see what could emerge out of the time we spent together. In 2001, a 10 day workshop was set up on Boon Bandan Farm in Northeast Thailand. Next, please. On the invitation of Khun Pan Parahom, seen here um, in the middle with the yarn, she's died, um, one of the farm's resident owners. A central sala space was constructed to host local artisans, musicians, students, and people from the nearby villages to become part of the gatherings. Thinking of the workshop as not becoming work, the participating artists were told they did not have to focus on an end result of making a, their own work, but instead to be open to conversations and experiences and in the exchange of knowledge and practices. So workshops were set up by artists as well, uh, which took various forms like walking in the landscape to identify medicinal and edible plants, making a kiln on site, sourcing clay from the creek, making and firing objects, learning natural dyes, uh, traditional cloth and basket weaving techniques, video filming, editing, and so on. Next, please. Uh, reconnecting with the farming community and continuing the conversations we had begun in 2001, in 2008, we established a residency project on the same farm explicitly to explore links between traditional and contemporary art practices. We specifically brought different generations together as residents for a month long period, along with developing works individually or collaboratively. As before in 2001, students from local schools, regional technical institutes and art schools were invited by, to workshops set up by artists. Um, in between, in 2003 and 2005, our projects took different formats. But taking a cue from mail art projects and networks of yore, the call for participation in procreation post-creation, which is going to be presented at Cooper Gallery, was shared widely by email, uh, artists' email lists and responses from people, majority of the partisans were unknown to us, started pouring in from around the globe spanning from Mongolia to St. Vincent and the Grenadine Islands. In the same year, we were offered funding to establish the Womanifesto website. And as a natural step, we started to plan the web-based project, No Man's Land. Next, please. Um, you can visit uh, both the projects on our website. Um, I won't take the time to for the animation to play out. Uh, but yes, you can you can access it on our website. Um, next, please. After the 2008 residency, Nitya and I made the decision to pause. Funding was hard to come by, and at this point in our lives, attending to our homes and caring for our families, both immediate and extended extended, was a priority. With Nitya. Tia sole in charge of bringing up her two children and both of us caring for aging parents. We made the decision to pause and reactivate as and when circumstances allowed. 
I think of what came next as phase two of Woman Manifesto almost a decade later in 2000, 2017, we started working on the archive, exhibiting it and realizing new projects. The exhibitions made publicly available for the first time, many of the photographs, videos, artworks, documents, publications and other ephemera archived over three decades. Around the same time, we were approached by John Tain, the head of research at Asia Archive in Hong Kong to digitize the Women Festo archive for their research collection. And it's available online uh, if you wish to visit. So during this time, we started planning our next project um, after this long break. Uh, and it was intended to take place at the end of 2019, 2020. But with the pandemic impact impacting us all, we had to rethink and adapt our idea of a physical gathering in Thailand, facing the situation of not knowing how our realities would unfold. Nitya and I invited some of the participants from previous projects to host local gatherings in their locations instead. They were asked to connect with artists in their immediate vicinity and set up a meeting point, a tangible space to convene face to face whilst following the social distancing guidelines. Thus, amidst the lockdown, Women Manifesto 2020 gatherings opened up conversations with groups joining in from Udon Thani in Thailand, Baroda here in India, Berlin in Germany, Sydney, Australia, Basel, Switzerland, and London. The lead person, in each location invited friends and colleagues and followed their own team in relation to their immediate situation and consideration of what a gathering could be in the uncertain context of those times. What happened locally was linked in an international network via this blog set up to share. The questions we collectively asked ourselves were, how do we define togetherness and how can we create and sustain support proximity and a sense of touch across cultures and geographical borders in such a time. Next, please. So with this in mind, um, in May 2021, La Suemo, uh, which literally stands for last Sunday every month, an online meeting space for gathering virtually was set up by Lena Eriksson from Basel, Durban from um, Lübeck in Germany, and myself as an informal community based on friendship and sharing. Bridging distance to connect, especially with many still in enforced isolation, even after the lifting of lockdowns, uh, during which digitally connecting via pla platforms such as Zoom, Jitsi, et cetera, came to mean so much. We thought it crucial to keep the conversation going so opening up a digital courtyard on the blog, we gather here to find ways to be with each other, a welcoming ideas, collaborations, to talk about new works being developed. And occasionally we set up activities that we can work on together. Um, we um, are currently uh, completing Sonic Trilogy or we're, we've just completed the second part of the trilogy and the third one is about to begin. Um, it's um, um, gathering sound bites at different uh, times of the day. So the first one was morning, the second one is middle of the day, and the third one is the end of the day. And um, we call it three seasons, if you like. Um, and it's a sort of uh, question about, uh, yeah, uh, are we still able to very clearly say that we have three seasons or four seasons given what our weather conditions are? Um, and uh, so it, it's, it's, it's a sound work that is coming out of it. Um, so each session of Las Suemo starts with talking about the weather in our respective locations. It is an exchange of information about the overall reality of the day, of the place, the weather, the environment, and the political horrors. A core group, group of participants from previous Manifesto projects are invited and they're joined by new people with no previous direct connections who become part of the ever-growing circle of different generations. It is about communication, making and maintaining connections and bridging the gaps to find ways to do things together. Las Suemo gatherings are 
documented by participants making visual and written notes and taking the occasional screenshot. In keeping with maintaining an open and safe space, we use the digital tool, but not do not want our conversation spread in the digital sphere. So our sessions are not recorded, except when we specifically plan to present, for example, this online performance, um, uh, images, gestures, performance, which we did uh, for a project called Bang Bang uh, that took place at the Tangley Museum. So one last way more gathering that took place was around mending, repairing and patching. And in, in current times, we felt that the very fabric of life feels so fragile. And the mending, it was to sit together and to connect and to tell stories of our experiences and also related to what each one was bringing in on the Sunday. Next, please. Uh, these are the visual notes from the mending session. Next. Which then led us to setting up a We Mend at um, the Womanifesto Flowing Connections, a survey exhibition, uh, which was mounted at the Bangkok Art and Culture Center in 2023. Uh, here, it was uh, set up for the period of three months and the public was invited to get involved in the ongoing activity um, and on one Sunday during the exhibition, the last Suemo participants joined in online um, to, to continue mending along with people on site. Um, next, please. Uh, so some shots from Womni Festival Flowing Connections with the women there in the center. Next. So we meant was thought of only for the exhibition and we had no thought or plan to spread the project. But the response from people um, also with some writing in and their wish to be involved got us thinking of continuing. We started to invite those that had shown interest and in artists previously connected with Boom Manifesto to set it up in their location along the same lines to gather fabric offcuts and sewing materials and offer a space for social engagement. Um, so in Bangkok, we had uh, multiple spaces um, and artists such as Teiko Bayashi, Komu Mistri, setting up in their homes, um, Al Madam in Sharjah in a women's community. Um, and also uh, we have universities getting involved, uh, the textile departments uh, as um, they will at the, for the Lahore Biennale and then here from Dundee University as well. Next. This is a first permanent space of Womanifesto, if you like. This is where Nithya lives. Um, we are now setting up an archive room and library. Nithya has already run workshops there, um, mainly concentrating on the immediate area and local artists and uh, planned in future uh, residencies and homestay options. Uh, in December, we will host a feminist writing workshop with a focus on writings coming out of Southeast Asia. And to end, um, I would like to uh, go to the next slide, please, of um, uh, Womanifesto, long-term Womanifesto members, some who have been there uh, from the very beginning, um, who we uh, commemorated also at Womanifesto Flowing Connections. And I wish to share here with you Chitima Kutanam, who started as a volunteer in 2001, Jitima, uh, Jirati Kutanam Radha, Jitima Polsavik, uh, who was there from the very beginning, a performance artist, poet, and activist, Pan Parahom, whose farm uh, welcomed us, who, who welcomed us um, um, to come and stay on her farm, and Tari Ito, uh, whose work you will see um, at, uh, at, the, at the exhibition um, in Cooper Gallery. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Vasha, for sharing your reflections and uh, all these inspirations from your work with the Women Manifesto. And uh, yeah, I'm just holding up this uh, um, exhibition invite cards. As you see, uh, Terry Ito's work have featured as a lead image for outside the circle. And also women will be installed as an ongoing participatory installation at Coop Gallery. So now I shall invite Griselda Pollock 
to um, be in the space and to do your presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and that was so fascinating. The, the, the depth and range of that work and your collective is, is so inspiring and it's vitality that it continues the present. Can I have my presentation if that's possible, Peter? Um, my presentation is, is a bit more local. It's uh, centered on this island uh, of the of Great Britain. And um, the focus is on what I want to share with you is the notion of uh, feminist collective learning, the foundations of um, the transformation that's brought by feminism is not on individuals. It's often as there was nothing for us, we had to create our own feminist spaces and indeed our feminist learning. So I'm going to talk about a little bit of a personal history from the Women's Art History Collective, which I was a founding member in 1973 to um, the completion or the closure by my university of the uh, master's program in feminism and the visual arts. So it's a bit of memories. Um, can I have the next slide, please? Um, the Women's Art History Collective was a group of women who came together in response to and to protest the censoring of the work by a Swedish um, revolutionary artist, a revolutionary feminist artist, Monica Schur, in 1973, when she showed a work which showed a woman giving birth, which was herself, in this sort of monumental form, uh, but added to it the notion of God giving birth. So she was accused in the British press of blasphemy and was censored for obscenity. And um, Monica Schur had published, in fact, one of the founding works of feminist literature. We always think of everybody talks about what happened in America, but she brought, she wrote a text called Towards a Revolutionary Feminist Art, which is rooted in a feminist critique of Western male dominated art world and the absence of women so early and was a call for women to organize themselves and to think for themselves. So she put on this exhibition with, as you can see, a range of other artists at a library, because obviously art institutions wouldn't show this kind of work. And when a, 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 um, a meeting was called, a number of us turned up to, um, can I have the next one, please? And we decided this were artists and I wouldn't say art historians, but people who'd studied art history who were dismayed by the absence of women that included Roger Kaparka and myself, and also some other names that came into the Women's Art History Collective in the course of its life that you may have come across in terms of art historians like Lisa Tickner or Anthea Callan. Um, on the edges of it was a wonderful curator and also feminist art historian, Frances Carey, and a wonderful novelist called Ruth Pavey, who was uh, uh, herself a, 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 an artist and now a wonderful writer. Now, what did we do in the Feminist Art History Collective? We pooled whatever knowledge we had and we read book feminist books. We tried to educate ourselves with whatever was coming out and I'll talk about that. We studied the Feminist Art Journal, which was being produced by Cindy Nemza. We examined issues of self-representation by some you know doing different exercises with each other led more by the artists than by the art historians uh we went and looked into museums we researched what was in their collections we looked at contemporary and reviewed contemporary exhibitions and we taught in fact a couple of evening classes for um you know outside of the institution on women in art and we even dared to go into these extremely male dominated art schools to um present our research on women in art our analysis of the representation of women across the full range of visual images and our um, analysis of the language through which sexist hierarchies and structures were constantly being pre produced. And as a result of this, could I have the next one? Um, uh, we wrote some books, but I just wanted to give you a sense of what the resources we had, which are not art historical resources for the most part. We were critiquing civilization. We were inspired by John Berger's ways of uh, seeing. We had the early essays by Linda Nochlin from there. Um, 
we drew on literary theory, we drew on these key writers, particularly sexual politics, the female eunuch, um, and the dialectic of sex. I remember us having very, very urgent discussions and even arguments about these different feminist positions. But what I wanted to put in there is the book on Ankle Vat, which was one I particularly introduced into our group as a resource, which was about um, uh, Jan Merdal and his, his colleague Gun Knessel were visiting uh, Angkor Wat in Cambodia um, and wondered, and with the Vietnam War and all the horror of it, that uh, going on at 30, 40, 60 kilometers, 100 kilometers away, he was asking, what is it to be in this particular kind of world thinking about art and of course what it inspired us was we're not thinking about art we're thinking about the monuments of power we're thinking about the the relics of systems political systems uh, that we should be analyzing and learning from and not allowing to be merely aestheticized the feminist art journal was again something and i think magazines were so important and cindy nems is setting this up as changed our lives because we had access to the interviews and analysis uh, of art that was emerging as women came together in uh, different parts of the world. Can I have the next one, please? Okay, um, and collectives. It's so important to understand the what is now being sort of formulated as a history of the women's movement through major names or, you know, key publications. It wasn't. It, it was just people who were angry, distressed, determined and inspired to get together. So the founding of um, Spare Rib was a crucial communicational network. And as you can see in the picture on the right, Rosie Parker was the first arts editor because she said to these otherwise, you know, um, politically oriented feminists who are going to research money and power and law and labor and work conditions. She said, no, no, you've got to deal with culture. Can I have the next, please? Um, and in fact, Spare Rib became the, the place where we could publish. And that's why the importance of magazines. Uh, I published some of my first articles, Underground Woman, when I went and investigated the absence of women in the National Gallery. Um, Old Mistresses is when Rosie Parker reviewed the first exhibition in America called Old Mistresses and um, picked up on uh, various aspects of the relationship between contemporary art as well as Prince. Uh, one of my first big reviews was written about the show by Lucy Lippard Issue, which was held at the um, uh, ICA. So this is a very important area. But as you say, Spare Rib was also a crucial sense that even we were inserting art and culture into it, it was also giving us this total picture of the conditions of women and indeed the variety of struggles that women were included, including, as you can see from the lower right hand, the very important um, uh, activism of Asian women in London and, and across Britain in terms of struggles in factories and the famous Grunwick strike was one of the most mobilizing strikes led by Asian women against their gender, dif gender differentiated and eth ethnically differentiated pay. Can I have the next one, please? Um, so some of the outcomes from this collective work now appear as books in the name of individuals, but I wanted to uh, relate them to the sense of what made possible the ambition and the daring of writing a new kind of feminist art history. So Angel in the studio by Anthea Callan, uh, Lisa Tickner was already teaching at Hornsey College of Art a number, and she's one of the first to teach women in art uh, um, courses in, in Britain uh, at, at Hornsey, which was also a wonderful environment. Again, the sort of art schools being the sort of seedbed for a lot of discussions and debates, but her extraordinarily important book on the history of the political self-representation of women remains, I think, one of the great classics that came out of this period, not out of the collective directly, but out of its period, but she was a member of the collective at a certain point. Can I have the next one, please? Um, and then and Rosie Parker and I are kind of the survivors of a collective which went its own way after three or four years of being together. And we decided to write up the results of our researches and discussions into um, old mistresses with everybody else's permission that we would be the writers of this particular thing. We later wrote the history 
collected, we felt that if we didn't write the history of these ephemeral events that formed the women's movement in the 70s to 80s, nobody else would the institution would not archive it so i stress the importance of self-archiving and documenting all the way through and then we both took our different directions and began our careers as writers next one please now in armed with all of this and with this as a background i went to leeds and began teaching and obviously found in an art i was taught in a school of fine art um, and I chose to stay in a school of fine art, which is also to, has art history, and I can explain that more fully. But by a certain point, I realized we couldn't just allow feminism to be at like a one week um, seminar in other courses on social history of art or general things. We had to, because the vast majority of women in this space were, uh, the vast majority of students were women. So I decided to conceive of a dedicated MA in the visual arts, which was met a great deal of hostility from my colleagues, but got through. And it posed a new question, which is how to create a feminist learning space, not just a collective space through which I learned outside of the institution, but to do that in the institution. And so we drew upon the inspiration of a number of African-American thinkers, particularly bell hooks, who I've said teaching is a revolutionary activity and teaching to transgress, a very important thing. Elsa Barclay Brown writes in this book, Collection of Black Women in America, how do you teach something such as black women's history in an environment of a white society that is a dominant white society? How do you, in the classroom, negotiate the numbers of positions? And she drew on the work by Bettina Aptica called, how do you pivot the center? How do you displace your, your, sen your sense of being centered in your own experience to allow others people to be centered in their experience in which you may be actually a blot on their landscape? So this quote, feminist education, or this is from Bell Hooks, is that there is a sense of struggle with a visible acknowledgement of the union of theory of practice where we work together as students and teachers to overcome the estrangement and alienation that have become the norm in the contemporary university because they deny the specificity of class, of race, of gender, of sexuality, of neurosensory diversity. These are all suppressed under some particular normatization and we are then seen as agitators and difficult and resistors, but we have to understand that's the, the struggle. And my history of what happened in the um, attempts to develop feminist pedagogy uh, at in this UK university was published in the wonderful End Paradoxa by the extraordinarily important figure of Katie Deepwell, who has ensured a documentation and a space for our writing for so many years. Next one, please. Okay. Um, just some sense of the groups. I want to um, indicate that the, the key point about the, this course was I had to create a safe space for learning. And the safe space for learning meant that we had to start with the complexity and diversity of women as they come. So it's not just a women's space as if that's a simple unified entity. So I invited everybody to explain at the beginning of every class how they came to be there. Where was, what was their pathway to being in this room together in order to make sure that we had not silenced the histories, the real experiences, the real struggles, and also not ignored the, the diversity in terms of class experience, experience of histories of violence and distress, the uh, invisibility of certain issues, ethnicities, race, sexualities, and specific experiences of a relationship to learning. So the, the variations, can I have the next one, please? Um, and this formed, enabled, it became known internationally and attracted a considerable number of people from different places. I just want to acknowledge the wonderfully important Elsa Hsiang Chung Chen, who translated a lot of feminist literature into um, contemporary Chinese. Unfortunately, she has uh, she lost her life to a cancer very young, but she formed long term connections between Leeds and uh, Taiwan feminism and art history. And here's a picture of us together in conversation. I learned so, so much from her and, uh, and 
just want to honor her. Can I have the next one, please? We also had a very strong connection with women from Hong Kong. A number of artists came to Leeds to study over about a five or six uh, year period. Uh, I honor here particularly Ivy Ma. This is her installation for her show because the MA in feminism and visual arts uh, attracted art historians, people who had nothing to do with art hist history but came into, but artists, and we all shared a question of um, theoretical engagements with theory. And Ivy Maher is one who invited myself and Alison Rowley, uh, next one please, to Hong Kong to form of that further communication. One man took this MA uh, very bravely and was wonderful, Jonathan Whitehall, and this is his, the site, his, um, his MA show, uh, invite. He was examined by Lubaina Himid. Can I have the next one, please? Um, and out of this project came a number of, of, of publications because many went on to do PhDs like Vanessa Corby or Alison Rowley. Um, we um, collaborated, Vanessa and I, on a book on Eva Hesse. So we had another kind of sense of how we formed different ways of writing and collecting and supporting each other. And Generations and Geographies is a collection of essays in which I invited some very famous people so it would get published, but also gave the space for the first publications of many of the MA students who came from the program. Can I have the next one, please? So what I um, really want to, to stress is that um, there's this wonderful history from the 70s of feminist collective learning inspired by so many women in terms of trying to find a way of understanding that if it's not there in the institution, you get together and find it, you read together, you study together, and that led to being able to establish a sufficient position from which to create a, le a feminist learning space, but that needs to be understood as what makes it a feminist learning. It's not the content, it's actually the manner in which we teach, the manner in which we are together, and the manner in which we make a safe learning space for everybody to speak themselves and not experience, as it were, the, the levels of invisible, you know, unsaid exclusion that are part of the normative university. And the result of this was intervening in art practice and producing a number of major artists who came through this, but also art history. But fundamentally, it depended upon engaging with the international frame of feminist thought and theory. And this I cannot stress enough. We had to learn to struggle to read things. And some of the people on Mayfem will say they had meetings separate from the seminar where they worked together to, to confront these mind-bendingly difficult theories that I put in front of them about psychoanalysis or social structures or linguistics or anthropology. But by learning together, we would find that we could get something out of it, right? And then we'd let uh, something more, but we did it by sharing our knowledge that we brought of what we are and the other ones. And this links up with this idea that um, what Jean-Jacques Rancière calls the ignorant schoolmaster, that all teachers must accept that they are ignorant of the experiences that their students bring and that the things they do know about living in this world, but it's a coming together and a sharing where resources can be offered. And one very, very famous class I have, just example, where I couldn't understand the text I was teaching. So I simply said, let's all say what we, if we got anything out of this text and we built enough of a picture of a text by wonderful, brilliant Gayatri Spivak for us to do something with it at that point. It wasn't a matter of mastery. It was a matter of finding some resource for thinking at that moment. And that's why I really stress this question of feminist thought and theory linked in and challenged with art practice as a, as a model uh, of um, this feminist learning and creating a feminist space. So thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Agresoda. And and Vasha, you know, it's just incredible body of ideas uh, and, and the discussions and the both, you know, drawn on the historical discourse, but also, you know, it's so pertinent to today's um, lives we're, we're living. And I, I could see, you know, the, this 
Um, Griselda, you mentioned about uh, uh, Ansea's The Ignorant Schoolmaster. That's actually the inspiration for the title of The Ignorant and not school, this whole idea of flattening the hierarchies in the classroom. I think Bell Hooks talks many times about this idea of practice of freedom and you know, learning as a practice of freedom. Um, but I think now I shall just choreograph our situation here and I would let you two to ask each other a question. Um, because you never met, I, I think, although you perhaps know of each other's practice, um, but then this would be the opportunity if you want to ask each other one question, and then we could uh, open um, to the floor. Okay, well, could I ask a question to Varsha first, because I think it's so important. I am so enthralled at the longevity and the sustainedness of your um, community, this co collective community that you've created. Um, and the move from the real meetings to the virtual meetings, has this been a way in which you feel that the, the, the liveliness of your actual meetings and locations and actions can still be kind of preserved and carried on? You know, can you still feel the, the the future for the women festo i mean in sense that that it feels it has num a, a double level of the real meetings and the world that you that you put out through the virtual history of it um i think uh, uh firstly i think it's um very much uh keeping in uh, the way it came comes about is, you know, following this sort of what's going on in our lives um, and the flow. So, for instance, doing a publication, the procreation post creation, was really because Nithya was pregnant with her first child, and there's all these questions about, oh, you, I'll have a baby and my life's going to change, and so what's going to happen after I have the baby, and and then you know because we we were always struggling for funding. So because we were actually offered funding to set up a website, then we said, well, now it has to be a web project. And of course we can have 85 people joining in uh, into this web project and each one can log in and each one can upload uh, their work by themselves. And, you know, it was that also uh, how much you could handle. So if there were two of you working together, then you could handle this much. Or you sort of always adapted uh, to to find a way to do projects. And the other thing was that I think it was the excitement of an idea, and we would get very often get I mean almost always get carried away with this excitement, and we think really really big, and then we told ourselves that then we will achieve what we can. We will not send set that as an end goal, and. Um, I think it's been kind of a natural progression um, in a way of then just embracing. I mean, the the lockdown uh, brought, you know, we, we put together the entire, we worked on sorting the entire archive online, actually, during that very strict early months of the lockdown with, um, you know, one of us in Sydney, Australia, John Tain in Hong Kong, me here in Baroda, Nitya in Thailand, uh, Nilufar Akhmut was in Lahore, and we would actually meet uh, once a week uh, to, to sort through material all on Zoom. And, and it just became so natural in a way. Uh, and then there was this question of actually trying to feel like we were not all in Zoom windows. And, you know, with La Suemo, that's what we said, that how can we create a sort of a setting of either being in somebody's studio or in a coffee shop or meeting somewhere where um, you know you you didn't feel that uh, you were just virtually uh, connected, but that you could feel a real connection. And after the initial Sundays, um, we we started to feel that, and and we made that decision that no, we will not record, we will not allow a camera in. We would like to keep it very much that you could talk about anything and everything, and without a worry that it might get out and get you into trouble 
uh, as uh, you know, it could. Uh, uh, if you talked about monarchy or religion and all of these things, so um, mm. I I think that that's and then now we've continued. So we've you know we we found that we we can actually realize projects as well. You know, like the Sonic trilogy and. Uh, sound bites from everywhere and it becomes really exciting so if we set the time as a morning I mean it's um, morning in uh, you know Australia is very different a uh, timing to morning here if you put it, all those sounds together it jumbles up the mornings and you kind of think ah oh, what's this morning you know uh, so yeah it's playing with that whole thing as well so I think it's just in a way organically just you know mm -hmm. goes from one step to another Thank you. Well, I would like to, uh, I'm very curious about the collectives. Uh, you showed that photograph of uh, groups of, of collectives uh, or, or people who are working together, obviously. And I also am quite curious about how um, they sustain themselves. I mean, were they just artists or was it a mixed group of people? And, you know, uh, uh, one of the things is that you keep something going, right? That you meet, have to meet over and over again, over a period of time for it to develop, you know, like Bo Manifesto has in a way that we never thought beyond the next project, whether we would have the energy or we would even have the funding or money to do something, but we always found a way to do something, even if it was small. Um, so, you know, what sort of, strategies that did they have and would you do you know anything about that and how did they keep going well i know in a sense i don't think collectives are the collectors i'm talking about did keep going in a sense because there was a natural there was natural life of the uh, so the women's art history collective we were precipitated by this shock of the reaction to a, a feminist work and we had we made it up as we went along. That's why we we just knew we had to get together, and then we set ourselves these different projects, you know, and talked our way through, etc. So the the Women's Art History Collective um, actively met for for probably three years, two and a half, three years, in a sense of a weekly meeting of people, um, and obviously history took caught up with us in a way because. The, the need for just being up, you know, there were artists, there was artists, you know, student artists, I mean, I was still just an MA student beginning my PhD and so forth. And so when we were not any organ, you know, in official things, we were not very successful at that point in, in terms of our professional life. But it was that wonderful sense of a movement around us and that stuff was being published and it was happening and we could collect materials like you know from the feminist art journal we'd all get it once a month and then talk about it i, I just think that's a very important aspect and then at a certain point it had given us a base for as we went off you know to earn our own livings in different ways but the nature of the experience of women getting together to say we have been given no tools by our education to decipher our own lives. To, and we are deciphering not our own lives, but many different women's lives, which are not necessarily compatible with each other, or even we didn't have the concept of agonism. We hadn't read Ranciere at this point to understand, you know, that there's a dominant voice and silent voices. We had to fight those out. And I think it's not their longevity, but the intensity of that sense of you can, create together a means of assembling tools with which to analyze the and pierce this sort of awful kind of opacity of patriarchy and sexism and racism and nowadays everybody thinks oh that they weren't into these things they weren't but of course we were confronting it in, in each other right we, we we did it through partly consciousness raising but then the sense of the projects with which we and I, I can't emphasize enough when I look at Old Mistresses as a book. Um, I just read a letter. I have a letter that Rosie Parker wrote to me and she said, you know, 
because uh, we, we were the the last two members of the collective that met regularly to try and work out what this and it was just this work that we did all the time. What is making what we're trying to say different from all these books coming out of America about women artists? What is it that we need to analyze? And it would neither of us would have got there, but we didn't get there because you know she thought and I wrote or I thought and she wrote. We 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 really 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 worked on the resources we had and tried to work out what is it that makes it possible for our the men around us to laugh at our project of talking about women in art why can they laugh at us why can they say this is a ridiculous thing right we we needed to get a way into that which i think we got in through the language but then there's another bit where she says, we can't just talk about women artists. Each one has to be in her own time, in her own space, in her own practice. And that was because we had artists saying, you don't understand practice, right? So that's why we did these exercises of doing things together where the artists would say, no, you're just, you know. So, I mean, that element of trusting other women with these huge questions, right and knowing that you need them and you need all the all of them you need all the different voices even if sometimes they're going to challenge you and say you've made a you know heteronormative assumption there or you're just a white middle class woman sure okay but we're going to deal with that because we are still those are not reasons for us not to struggle through this and i think that was i think the importance of the collective alongside really paying attention to what other women are writing, all these great minds, but at the same time, what I, I put in the Feminist Art Journal, all this other art that we could study, which would be a resource for thinking, not necessarily art or even art history, but thinking life. Yeah. Yeah. That's so fantastically um, well put. Um, Griselda, but also, you know, this, this whole idea of uh, um, how to be together, you know, how, you know, we, we could always be together, form a group, form a collective, but uh, how and how to sustain that. Th this whole idea of, I think, a manifesto talks about a lot, uh, th this care, the caring, you know, how to care. It's not about, oh, you're my mate, a pat on your shoulder, but then most of the time to equip ourselves with this kind of critical, reflexive kind of um, ability, you know, to challenge each other is also a support. Griselda, you talked about, you know, how to be with each other. I just reminded um, some years ago, um, Annabelle Nicholson um, did this collaborative writing project called A Room of Our Own. And she really talks about how to um, build up the solidarity with the other women artists to fight the, the competition created in the art world. I think that that's, you know, it, it's just your your talk just really reminded me of that, so how we deal with those neoliberal ideology prevailing in the art world, in this so-called art world. I think perhaps now we, we have uh, some time to open um, to the floor and um, for some questions. If I've got quite a lot of questions, but I think we should let audience and the students in the lecture theater to ask their questions. Hi there. I'm just going to voice out some of these questions from the students in the lecture theater and do feel free to add uh, any more questions in the chat. The first one we have asks, as you mentioned, Varsha, We Manifesto was set up in a society that was still predominantly patriarchal. Did you face many barriers when you formed as a feminist artist collective? Um, not, not barriers so much as um, being ignored in a way. Um, also hearing comments like, oh, these women will never get it together. Um, so kind of this, this um, yeah, being brushed aside. And, you know, um, I was also sort of asked at, at an interview uh, of, of this notion of 
women being mere dabblers, you know. Um, so those kind of comments and things. And um, but uh, but it you know it was on the other hand um, a very very open, um, very kind of welcoming the spaces that we worked with, the people we worked with as well, of course. Um, and they'd already, you know, as I mentioned at the very beginning, um, the Trudy section exhibition had happened and there was already this one space, uh, but it was rare um, to find, um, you know, ex kind of an invitation or kind of as women to be considered as part of sort of group exhibitions. Uh, so, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, this question follows on from Amanda Lynch in the audience. Where do you see feminist practice going in the future? Do you see new collectives forming? Do you think the urgency has changed? Like this is for both of you. Griselda, you're, you're on mute. I was going to say, Pasha, did you want to answer that first or? Um, no, please go ahead. Okay. Um, um, I never answer questions of saying, do I think where it's going? I, in a way, it's much easier to look back and say, how did we arrive here and make some use of that knowledge, right? Um, because in a sense, um, I don't believe art goes anywhere. I think history and situations and the constant change of our lives brings forth from our, you know, demands for different kinds of, to address different things. So there isn't something called feminist art. There are, is art inflected or inspired by feminist thinking and practice, right? Because there's always art in that sense, but this art historical notion that art moves forward and we've been somewhere and now we have to go somewhere else. No, sometimes you have to um, do archaeology. You need to rediscover certain things. You need to look at the examples of things in the past. So I, I think um, the historical moment of feminism as it came about in that um, the 1970s was a, a cultural, intellectual, as well as political moment of great complexity and that the collective was a crucial model of it. It's a crucial model of feminist work. It is, as I think Varsha will say, it's hard work, right? Because this this, and what, what Sophia has also said, we don't come together in a nice, smooth um, sort of homogeneity, right? There are real differences of our experiences, you know, uh, which we, we give these big names to, class, race, gender, sexuality, things, but also, you know, age, you know, whether you've had children or not have children, whether you could come think of the possibility of it, or your yourself in sense changing a body that doesn't want to, you know, or can't have, you know, doesn't want children or can't have them. All of these things have to be dealt with, with the respect to the complexity of our experiences in which we have a shared kind of political ambition to create something that is not as vicious, exploitative, you know, corrupt and destructive as it is. And so 1970s collectors didn't know neoliberalism. We were fighting something else. We were fighting the legacies of fascism, totalitarianism, civil rights, the Vietnam War, lesbian and gay rights, women's rights. This was a great revolt and also students. The big five, we took onto the stage of history and said, now your world that you've given us, you adults, is shit, right? We're going to analyze it and do something like it. Whereas now you have different um, challenges which you have to negotiate by having some sense of history, but some anatomy of your present. And the anatomy of your present is the communication system, right? That is the biggest threat to feminism at this point, is AI, social media, and the communication system, which is a phenomenon that wasn't there when we were sort of sitting together with magazines and stuff in the yeah. 70s. So yeah. I think you have to say, what what's the problem now? And that and violence against women, those are the two, and they're connected. 
think yeah. we got uh, quite a lot of questions coming in. Um, maybe we, we 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 have about ten minutes. Do we have ten minutes? Yeah, and we Could need you, to go I, through them. Could you read all the questions out, and maybe we can see what people are us are thinking? Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Peter, I'll, I'll do that now. Um, Griselda, you described the invisibility of older aging women in Western art as quote, radical lack in our repertoire of cultural representation. Can you share your views on the development in age studies? Okay, next question. Does the term we manifesto extend itself to all genders, gender complexities in today's society? Varsha's nodding there. Um, question, you seem to, um, I think this is maybe, Varsha's just answered this, but worth saying it for Griselda. Question, you seem to both be talking exclusively about women within these feminist ideas. Would you say these feminist projects transcend gender or are limited to cisgender women? Question, Griselda, are you aware of any shift in the reception of female artists into the establishment or is there always a threat of regression according to the social political narrative of the time? Question for Varsha. Varsha, you've spoken about the collective extend into your homes. Would you say that domesticity and the concept of the home and the host bleed into the art and projects we manifesto create? And the question for both of you, at, at Duncan and Johnston, it's week one of the new semester. Many are new to studying art. Could you both offer one tip or word of wisdom for our new aspiring artists and art historians? Uh, we've got whoa, a couple more coming in. I'll read this last one that we had from the students and then maybe you could recap them, but there's a few more. For Varsha, what do you think is the glue that keeps Wu Manifesto together over time? Is it a sense of frustration and anger in reaction to something like Griselda mentioned or something more? Great questions. Okay, I'll answer that last one. Um, what keeps us going is uh, curiosity, uh, you know, uh, excitement, our friendship, our um, uh, wanting to know more, wanting to connect with even more, um, you know, artists, women, uh, communities, what, what's going on around us. Um, also really connecting back into our own cultures in many ways. Um, uh, and yeah, um, there's so much, there's so much, so much to keep us going. Uh, and always to find a way, I mean, not to, not to just wait for like, you know, we made the decision that even if the funding doesn't come through and even if it's just two of us or three of us that can gather to do something that we would do it, yes. And yes, our domestic spaces become very important here. Um, you know, um, yeah, there is no separation really in a way. The living together, also meeting, the cooking, living, um, you know, spending days together, not necessarily making work. That's, yeah, something that we... Um... I wanted to start quick two 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 quick one of those questions quickly. One is uh, a tip for everybody is to study. There is no way other than you you cannot develop except if you open your mind and your curiosity into to various sorts of things, etc. You don't become something. You build it slowly and surely with. And the other part of the collective is the whole collective range of thoughts. And I think that the problem nowadays is we've lost that sense that we need to keep reading each other, keep watching each other, keep studying and, you know, the, 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 the works that are put into the world, et cetera. The other question, uh, which is when you say about this, I, I do think we've been distracted by the whole debates about gender and things, et cetera, because we've all been saying the complexity and diversity of those who have to live their lives under whatever imposed on us by the term woman. And 
if you think that this is a sort of academic thing, just think of what happened in India recently in terms of the terrifying sense of, um, you know, what the kind of policing of women for daring to be in the world, to travel in the, in the cities, to have jobs, to think everything that we want so you could become somebody. You are responsible to yourself to become the somebody you can become. And um, you may have to negotiate that. And, you know, this question of tearing women apart by making names and distinctions and using the term gender as if it's a kind of a labeling. In my gen generation, gender was an axis of power, just like race is an axis of power. We're not raced. There's no such thing as race. We're just human beings in all our diversity. Race becomes an axis of power. Class is an axis of power. Gender was an axis. It's not an identity. Now, that may be because I belong to another generation, but I think people are so over-anxious that the word woman might be exclusive or wrong or whatever. It just is a collective um, presence of questioning violence, power hierarchies, powers, exclusions, and we're in alliance with everybody else who's struggling for it, right? And so I feel that you just enjoy, enter into your studies to find something that makes sense for you, but you will need lots of other people that you will have to open yourself to in order to have the resources to do that. And then you'll make a nice contribution. And then when you become old, you'll be full of joy. <laughs> that you've done something for yourself, but for the world. Are there more questions, Peter? Um, maybe we can bring up now. Yes, um, there was, um, there was in there, there was a, a question around um, age that I think, okay. and then, the new questions are universities and art schools in the UK and many other places are now informed by practices of EDI, equality, diversity, and inclusion. It seems to have produced an assimilationist politics, i.e. we will let you in if you behave like us. The last UK government front bench was a case in point. How do we fight this assimilationist model in the institutions? Another one, curious to know why the course on feminism was concluded and how you broached that with how that was broached with you at the university. That's for yourself, obviously, Griselda. And a question around, could you speak a bit more about social media and violence against women and perhaps give some thoughts, advice about these new challenges? Okay. Um, I just thought the... The, the, the reason that the MA was closed is because people stopped coming. And people stopped coming because the people who were teaching them in the art schools did not know that this had been. So there was a moment where any woman who was interested in, in, in feminist questions, the tutors, male or female, would say, oh, you need to go to Leeds, there's a course for you, okay? There came a point where nobody, the people who were teaching, hadn't did not know about it and so the institution and the general patriarchy said, well, there's not enough people coming. So it 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 it, it lived its life, okay, and maybe doesn't need it because there were all sorts of people who've been on the MA feminism who went off and taught at Goldsmiths and in all sorts of places. They carried it on and people didn't have to come to Leeds. There are other spaces about it. Um I think that that was that was one. I just want to pick up one thing, two, two questions, which is you you pick up here, if I can dare, Varsha, which is um, people think that the visibility of certain women artists now is progress. And I have very grave concerns because adoption of certain women into the now completely financialized art market on a star system has absolutely zilt to do with feminism. It is so important that we understand that. And the fact that they talk about female artists yeah. is horrendous. The, the, the social category is women. Now, whether you are born women or you become women or such, the social category is women. 
And the art world talks about these things. And I think basically there's a great success of certain women nowadays because they're cheap. And one, the more we all agitate for the recognition of women artists, the more the investment that these collectors make in buying these works, promoted by Saatchi and Gagosian and all the rest of it, the richer their collections are. And we yeah. get entrained to appear to be supporting something yeah. which is absolutely at odds with what we are thinking that the art is about to do, which is to change the way we live and this links with the question we have to change the whole framework in which it is acceptable to sustain societies of femicidal societies the yeah. way they are yeah Basha, you have must have something to I, say. yeah i just wanted to say that you know this was very early early on with womanifesto where uh, when you're putting together a project or um, an exhibition um, you know, there is this, there is usually what you see is, you know, uh, if you take say Southeast Asia or Asia, you know, then you should have one artist from here, one from here, one from here, one from here, you know, and also, of course, you need the well-known ones, uh, which is the case still, you know, and the one thing with Womanifesto was that we, 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 we didn't even talk about it, but somehow it just happened that we all were thinking um, in the same way was that it didn't really matter uh, what who you what you were what name you had uh, what price you sold your work at or whether you sold at all or what you did but you just came as you are to be um, and 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 this this has remained uh, ever since this has remained throughout where uh, you know we've sort of um challenge that in the art world uh and, and what we see how it comes together now the biennales and all of that that comes together now um that we we you know even going ahead we we are not interested in really uh how famous you are or 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 any of that but we're we're interested in what you have to say and what you have to share Wow, that's that's so crucial. Exactly. Yeah. That, that's so wonderful. Um, I think we're over for ten minutes now. I think my, now perhaps is a good moment to conclude. And I would like to thank both Vasha and Griselda once again for such a fascinating in conversation. Those wealth of uh, ideas uh, and. Uh, um, you know, all, all these inspirations now, I, I think it's really, really exciting um, to hear you. But also, I think we will have opportunities to continue the discussion and the explorations of both of your practices and ideas through the exhibition outside of the circle. And just to pick on one thing, um, Griselda, you said earlier, on, you know, the complexity in in all of this in the history and in the present i just wanted to say you you know as cooper Gary, we have this motto we call it the complexity is a necessity especially um within the context of an art school and uh, i also see the last question from jessica about you know the, the social media and the violence you know all these what i would call um the you know how people learn these days is through social media, which is really, really dangerous in, you know, in relation to knowledge creation. It's not only production, but the creation. You know, the social media really, um, I, I feel it's kind of a subtarging the ability to imagine. You know, if you think about the idea of imagination as a revolutionary act, and that we really need to, or reflect on that. Um, and then what a feminism is, you know, you, you both said that it's, feminism is not just a body of the theories and that there's no such thing called a feminist art. It is about the, the influence and the in, in inspiration from feminist movements and the queer movements, what that brings to us. Um, so because uh, uh, Gertrude Spivak will be part of the 
outside the circle and uh, she will be one of the featured thinkers alongside of uh, uh, Gretelda. I wanted to quote um, Spivak as the end of the event and Spivak said that when we seem to have won or lost in terms of uh, certainties, art can teach us that there are no certainties, that the process is open, that it might be altogether solitary, that it is so. Um, and I think that's what I have learned from feminism too. There's no fixated discourse and definition what a feminism is or feminist art is. It is about remain open mind, I think. Um, so um, the forthcoming exhibition outside circle will open on the 17th of October. I just want to take this opportunity to invite everybody again. Uh, if you are in Dundee, um, and the exhibition will continue until the 1st of February in 2025. Um, the preview will also feature a collective performance, a manifesto class voicing outside the circle. And that will bring together, I believe, the first time the students and the lecturers from all art schools across Scotland. Um, so I hope uh, many of you would be able to join us at the preview, um, but also throughout the course of the exhibition. And thank you again, everybody. And uh, thank you, Vasha and the Grazelda. And have a good afternoon. And take care. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank Bye. you, Chris.